This is CBC Vancouver News. Eight hours with our baby in the middle of the night. Um, this is getting a bit frustrated. Parents and health workers worry with long waits at BC Children's Hospital as Ottawa and the provinces talk health care funding. I'm quite glad that she's taking accountability for the harm that she's caused me. A Kelowna Mountie pleads guilty to assault after dragging a university student during a wellness check. One of the most jarring season changes I've ever experienced. Like and snow on the mountains, snow on the highways. Winter weather hits BC with a jolt. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. It is a big pledge for Canada's beleaguered health care system. Today, here in Vancouver, the federal government pledged tens of billions of dollars to the provinces and territories to support frontline workers. But as Lindsay Duncombe explains, the money comes with conditions and some uncertainty. The wait to see a doctor at BC Children's Hospital over the weekend reached nine hours. Another institution at a breaking point in a country full of them. I would definitely agree with the word that it's in crisis or collapsing. I mean, we're, we're seeing people that don't need to be in the emergency room going in because they can't get access to care anywhere else. Dr. Perceau, please call extension 385. Federal funding has fallen to just 22%. In advertisements, the premiers blame Ottawa. The federal government says this year, provinces will receive $45.2 billion in health transfers, plus a one-time payment of $2 billion. The provinces say they need an additional $28 billion annually. The prime minister says cash will come, but it will come with yes, strings attached. So yes, we will be there with more money, but we need to make sure that more investments in health care ends up supporting the folks on the front lines. Specifically, the feds want the provinces to share data to make sure the money is actually solving problems, such as long wait lists and shortages of doctors and nurses. The federal government says it will also negotiate with provinces individually on specific funding. From the provinces, optimism, but no initial agreement. The federal government saying that they are prepared to invest more is good news. And we look forward to seeing details. It's unclear if a deal will be reached here this week. Even if it is, money is unlikely to flow until after a possible meeting between Canada's premiers and the prime minister. Canadians will have to wait, just like they do in emergency rooms. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. As Lindsay mentioned, the weekend brought long waits at BC Children's Hospital, and those continued today. As Leanne Young shows us, both experts and parents say it's clear the system is seriously strained. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Life is full of risks when you're not even a year old. But when the Clausens' then five-month-old banged her head before bedtime, they didn't want to leave her health to chance. I thought she was probably fine because she was behaving normally, but I called 811 just to make sure, and they advised us to go to the hospital. They rushed to BC Children's Hospital, only to end up waiting eight hours overnight before the family was led into a room. They only brought us into a room after I complained. <laughs> we were trying to be um, gracious and understanding, but, you know, eight hours with our baby in the middle of the night, um, it's just getting a bit frustrated. It took another three hours to see a doctor who was apologetic. So I had a conversation with the doctor and, and she admitted that it was a system problem and told us to write in um, saying, yeah, we need help. That was in June. Yesterday, again, wait times at BC Children's Hospital was estimated at more than eight hours. This family physician says she feels for her colleagues there. Having worked in emergency rooms myself as well, there's nothing more helpless feeling than knowing there are sick people outside in the waiting room that you cannot get to. Excessive wait times are just a symptom of systemic issues, she says, and the worst might be ahead. If this is what it looks like now and we haven't hit what is traditionally the peak of respiratory virus seasons, what is going to happen in November, December, January and will the hospital system and the healthcare system, frankly, be able to sustain that?
In a statement, BC Children's Hospital says they are busier than normal. Prior to April of last year, there were 135 visits per day. Now they average up to 150 visits. Half of the patients who showed up last month didn't require emergency care. Families like the Claussen say authorities need to step up with solutions. We've got to put the politics aside, the infighting. Um, it doesn't matter to us. That, that stuff is irrelevant when we're waiting in a waiting room for 11 and a half hours. Something has to happen <laughs> at a structural level, like quickly. For now, they just hope there won't be another ER visit in their future. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. New data suggests more than 2,000 people in B.C. will be killed by toxic drugs by the end of this year. It would be the second time this province has surpassed that grim benchmark in as many years. The B.C. coroner shows at least 171 people were killed in September of this year, putting the province's total at more than 1,600 who have died so far in 2022. The vast majority of those killed have been men between 30 and 59 years old. Toxic drug deaths are the leading cause of unnatural death in B.C. Six people, on average, are killed every day. That report comes on the same day as another funding announcement from Ottawa. The feds say they will spend $5 million on chronic pain resources to help stop people with untreated pain from turning to poisonous street drugs for relief. The federal mental health and addictions minister says the ways to reduce chronic pain and toxic drug deaths intersect. 50% of the deaths were people who had sought um, treatment for their pain in the pre pre previous year. This is unacceptable and that we have all heard about people being cut off their meds and then going to the street for their drugs. And so we don't think people should live in pain. Bennett says up to $4.5 million will be used to expand the Pain Canada network, chronic pain resources, and industry best practices. Money has also been allocated to support LGBTQ plus British Columbians and those in Chinese, Punjabi, and Arabic-speaking communities. A Kelowna RCMP officer has pleaded guilty to assaulting a nursing student at a UBC Okanagan dorm. Part of it was caught on camera. The CBC's Brady Strachan has more on the decision and how the victim is feeling. A warning for you, some people may find images in this story upsetting. Today was supposed to be the first day of the trial for RCMP Constable Lacey Browning. But at the start of the hearing, Browning stood up in court and announced that she intended to plead guilty to assaulting nursing student Mona Wang. The assault happened in early 2020 during an RCMP wellness check. The case made international headlines after video of the assault emerged later that showed Constable Browning dragging a young nursing student named Mona Wang out of her dorm room, down a hallway and into the building's common entrance area. Wang was handcuffed and lay motionless on the floor as several other students walked into the building past her and Browning. At one point, Browning was seen lifting Wang up by the hair and also stepping down on her head with her boot. Video of the incident prompted outrage and calls for police reform on social media. In a civil lawsuit and in interviews, Wang said she was experiencing mental distress and her boyfriend called the RCMP for a wellness check. She claimed Browning didn't offer medical assistance but handcuffed her and assaulted her. She said the incident left her with bruises and swelling on her face, along with emotional trauma, feelings of humiliation, shame and embarrassment. The civil lawsuit was settled out of court. The RCMP launched a criminal investigation last year and Browning was charged with assault. Browning initially pleaded not guilty to the charge. Upon the news of the guilty plea today, Wang says she was relieved her attacker accepted responsibility for the assault. Wang says there needs to be a systemic change in the way people suffering from mental health issues are treated, especially in the case of wellness checks. We deserve more compassion and more resources in order to, you know, combat this medical issue. I don't believe that um, police responding to these calls is the right route. Wang says she'll be paying attention to the sentence the court decides for Browning, and she says she hopes she won't be allowed to continue to work as an RCMP officer. Since the incident, Wang has continued her nursing studies and now works as a psychiatric nurse. As for Browning, she'll be back in court to set a date for sentencing. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna.
WestJet was forced to cancel more than two dozen flights today, saying a system-wide outage over the weekend is at least partly to blame. The Calgary-based company scrubbed flights en masse over the weekend after an apparent cooling issue caused the company's data center to shut down. The airline canceled more than 200 flights and others faced serious delays. Many passengers at YVR say they had trouble rebooking flights today. No one walking around to help, so I'm just like laughing by myself because I have no idea what's happening. So I don't know, we'll see where I end up today, I guess. My place was just supposed to fly out at noon, and then I got a notification yesterday that I got delayed for about an hour. So I was like, okay, whatever, I understand that. And then I got two or three more emails after that saying delayed, 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 and now it got delayed from noon till flying out at seven o'clock tonight. Yes, we got moved tonight. I'm hoping I can go through. I'm already delayed 24, 24 hours. So we stayed in the hotel last night. To, to log in on, I, wanna, I tried to check in online, but it's in error. Many times it's in error. You cannot check in, so they asked me to come log in on the counter. WestJet says 10 extra flights were put on schedule today. Three BC transportation agencies are going to offer free travel for military personnel on Remembrance Day as thanks for their service. On November 11th, BC Transit will offer free fare to active and retired personnel and cadets. BC Ferries will accommodate customers with military IDs or those traveling in uniform free of charge. And free rides with TransLink on all of its services to vets, active personnel, and anyone working in police and fire departments, the Canadian Coast Guard, and the BC Ambulance Service. Surrey's newly elected mayor and council was sworn in at City Hall tonight. Mayor Brenda Locke. Brenda Locke received her chain of office to many cheers. She beat out embattled incumbent Doug McCallum last month by less than 1,000 votes. Locke and eight councillors were welcomed with an audience of about 500 people. She says keeping the RCMP in Surrey is at the top of her to-do list. The RCMP are the police of jurisdiction in the city of Surrey. They will remain so moving forward. There are still well over 600 RCMP officers in this city, and so uh, we're just really maintaining what we already have. Locke adds she will ensure her council will maintain a respectful tone and bring back Surrey's ethics commissioner. Vancouver's new mayor was sworn in as well. Today, Ken Sim is the city's first mayor of Chinese-Canadian descent and has a majority on council. But as Joel Ballard tells us, he promises his ABC coalition won't spend the next four years steamrolling opponents. Honoured guests, please join me in welcoming the mayor and city councillors for the city of Vancouver. Even after you're elected mayor with a majority, it's hard to shake the first day jitters. I will be respectful of others. I will be respectful of others. I will demonstrate leadership and collaboration. I will dis sorry, say that again. I will demonstrate. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Ken Sim was ushered into office today, along with seven of his fellow ABC party members, including re-elected councillors Lisa Dominato, Sarah Kirby Young, and Rebecca Bly. Two Green councillors also returned to the chambers, as does re-elected councillor Christine Boyle. It's a historic moment for a city and province with a marked past of anti-Asian racism. 135 years after the first Chinese head tax, was paid just for the right to come here and work on building a railway. Vancouver has elected its first Chinese-Canadian mayor. Sim and Council inherit a city gripped by concurrent crises. Affordability, housing, homelessness, a toxic drug supply. Problems Sim hopes to address through collaboration. We are 11 people in this chamber with diverse lived experiences, and I think that's where you get your best answers. With a majority on council, Sim's leadership has already changed from the last four years. A minority government with opposing views that saw a record of more than 300 motions put forward, stretching city staff thin. But while they're open to collaboration, the outline councillors say they will also provide balance. I think we have a responsibility to disagree well and respectfully, um, and I certainly will speak up. Where, where it's going to come to a crunch, I believe, is around the budgets. That's where we voted differently more often than not in the previous council. Um, so I think it's going to take some work. Sim campaigned on a platform centred on law and order. He says his priority in office will be to hire 100 new police officers and 100 new mental health nurses. And the work begins immediately. Council convening for the first time in the chambers Monday night. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. 
Well, if you can see the Coast Mountains, you already know they're already blanketed with their first dusting of snow. We actually had some just about an hour ago. That has local skiers, hikers, and resorts very happy. Up on Mount Seymour, people were out today with their sleds and some crazy carpets, while others ventured into the backcountry. The mountain says 22 centimeters of snow has fallen in the past day, though it's not yet open for skiing and boarding until early December. Some venturing out say the winter weather arrived with a bit of a jolt. Crazy to think, uh, like two and a half weeks ago, it was almost 25 degrees out and we were in, uh, in shorts. And... I hope the trees are all happy with the cold weather. We didn't know if the snow was going to be nothing or something, and here we are, all of a sudden it's full of snow. Three feet of fresh powder, November 7th, couldn't be happier. The snow's arrival, though, also a good reminder to be prepared before you head into the wilderness. It's just totally uncomfortable. Like, nobody should have to live like that. With winter weather here, a broken heater has some Vancouver tenants fuming. After the break, they bring the heat to their landlord. Stick around. And hello to everyone watching our commercial free live stream. Good to have you here. An Alberta mother is being recognized for her personal loss and sacrifice. Her son was the last Canadian soldier killed in Afghanistan. She sat down with the CBC's Travis McEwen to talk about the way she is honoring him. July 5th. Candy Greff is reflecting on photos and memories of her son, Master Corporal Byron Greff. It's been 11 years since he died in Afghanistan. She's still grieving the loss, but she finds courage when thinking about why she misses him. Such a good soldier, such a wonderful son and father, husband, brother, cousin, grandson to everyone. I think I get that power and strength from him somehow. In 2011, Byron was killed by a suicide bomber. An armored bus was carrying troops through Kabul when it was struck by a car. The 28-year-old was the last of 158 Canadian soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan. He was scheduled to come home for Christmas. So we thought, we said, goodbye, see you at Christmas. Give him a big hug and you just don't realize that's the last hug you're going to get. Inside the Lacombe Legion is the Byron Greff Memorial Hall. And the Legion were the ones who nominated his mother Candy for the National Silver Cross Mother Award for this year. And it's why she's going to be in Ottawa on Remembrance Day laying a wreath. I want to do right by them and stand tall and do what I need to do in honor of all of those sacrifices through all of the years, not just Afghanistan, all of the years that people have lost their loved ones. When she lays a wreath at the nation's capital on Remembrance Day, it's also a tribute to her son. She's already wearing the Silver Cross medal proudly. I'm reflecting, thinking that he's looking down at us from heaven and that he is thinking, good job, Mom. Good job. A sentiment she'll likely lean on over the next couple weeks, helping her to honor a determined son who still inspires her. Travis McEwen, CBC News, Lacombe. Tenants of an apartment building in Vancouver's west side say enough is enough. They say they've been without proper heating for a month. 
The landlords insist they are working to fix the problem, but as Janella Hamilton tells us, with the mercury dropping, the tenants are tired of waiting in the cold. As someone who often works from home, Joshua Chartrand spends a lot of time in his apartment. Lately, layered in shirts and fuzzy blankets, surrounded by space heaters. It's just totally uncomfortable. Like, nobody should have to live like that. Chartron says the boiler in his building broke more than a month ago, leaving all 10 units without heat. And weeks later, still no word on when it will be fixed. We are paying for residents and not given the basic necessities. The property manager, who's also a landlord and co-owner of Oakwin Realty, says the building is 100 years old. Because of its age, additional steps need to be taken before a technician can replace the boiler. So we have ordered tests for the room because there may be asbestos um, and we've booked an abatement company if there is and then, you know, throwing it at the boiler. The company says the new boiler will cost around $60,000 and it's not a quick or easy purchase. Under the Residential Tenancy Act, primary heating issues are considered an urgent emergency repair. You know, we are treating this as an emergency and it is going to depend on the trades that we have in place. CBC News reached out to two different boiler technicians. Both said asbestos testing could delay repairs by a few days. And new boilers are readily available in BC. This lawyer who advocates for tenants says landlords are responsible for supplying an alternative source of heat while working to solve the issue within a reasonable time. Chang says every unit has been provided at least one space heater. We've been supplied tower heaters, which only do so much. Um, and you can only plug a few in before it breaks the circuit anyways. In an email, Oakwin Realty instructed tenants to strictly follow the safety guidelines when using the space heaters, including turning off the heater when you leave the room or go to bed. Chartron is considering going to the Residential Tenancy Board, but has been deterred by the backlog of cases. So it still could be a number of months before that even would go to a hearing, simply about an order for the landlord to repair the underlying issue. Until heat is restored, Chartron wants at the very least for his landlord to reduce everyone's rent. And I was just told it's not approved and that maybe hydro could be subsidized in a way and we had to be patient. But with freezing temperatures right around the corner, Chartron says residents can't wait much longer. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. There's a live shot of Georgia Street. Wind warnings, snow warnings, and it is getting colder across BC. Winter weather has abruptly arrived in the fall. In fact, more snow was falling across the south coast not too long ago. Johanna will have your BC wide forecast after this. I suppose it's art, or it could be called art. Um, I take it that's the Madonna book? Or? Well, no, this is not Madonna's book of explicit erotic photos. Try again. Do you recognize who it is? Well, that doesn't mean a thing to me. It's Kit, Kim Campbell, but... Uh, and uh, she's, she's... Who's Kim Campbell? I wouldn't have a clue. This is Kim Campbell, like you've never seen her before. Canada's Justice Minister and one of 66 prominent Canadian women featured in this book by Salt Spring Island photographer Barbara Woodley. The book features women like former Olympic skier Nancy Green Rain, and here's actress Cynthia Dale in what some might consider a fairly provocative pose. Still, it's this photograph that's getting all the attention. I, I call her now Madonna Campbell. I mean, uh, she's uh, now we got this photograph, which we don't know whether she's jumping into the judicial robes or jumping out of them. The, the comparison between me and Madonna is the comparison between a strapless evening gown and a gownless evening strap. I mean, let's be serious. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to see next. Maybe a blonde ambition tour and perhaps, a, perhaps a, a, a coffee table book, you know? I mean, you know, hello, shoulders are not, uh, are not naughty. No, but well, we'll let her Vancouver Centre constituents be the judges of that. She has the right to 
pose any way she chooses. I think artistically it's great. Uh, I think she's giving a message about strong, independent women that are happy with themselves, and I think it's great. <laughs> I've seen it. I, I think she was crazy to do that. Why is that? Because she looks... She's in a dignified position, and she's going naked. You see, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> I mean, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking. I mean, these day and age, I think the most people, you know, and, and most families can withstand the glimpse of a pair of well-upholstered shoulders, um, you know, without, uh, you know, the children running amok and, you know, being led astray. I think it's probably pretty well okay. At the University of British Columbia, there's a picture of Kim Campbell, too. Only here, she's wearing her robes in a law school graduation photograph. God forbid, I should must remember never to swim in a public swimming pool. I assure you, I can show considerably more flesh when I'm in a bathing suit. Kelly McLugan, CBC News. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join Kitsan journalist Angela Starrett as she uncovers land theft in Canada in the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Land Back, out November 15th. And never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. Installing the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Our BC wide weather forecast now with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Joe, um, interesting day out of the sky, especially oh. when winter arrives in fall. In yes, in uh, early fall, <laughs> it, we've Check we have had date. all yeah exactly mm. we've had all four seasons, pretty much in the span of just a couple of weeks, and at least three of those seasons in the span of three days with those back to back to back atmospheric rivers, the windstorm Friday night, the first snow for much of Metro Vancouver uh, yesterday, and now that Arctic air mass bringing another shot of snow. Let me show you what this looks like on the satellite and radar. So we have two competing systems. The Arctic outflow is now set up across the province. You know that means the cold, dry air from the interior racing through the valleys and inlets towards the coast. That's what's leading to those strong winds across the strait. Meanwhile, that spinning low just off the coast of Washington, injecting moisture into this story. And that's why we are seeing wet snow once again across Metro Vancouver. Accumulations will likely stay above 150 meters, but if you like the look of those dusted local mountains, uh, a lot more where that came from as things clear out tomorrow afternoon. So how sound under that wind warning, snowfall warning uh, along the Malahat, Goldstream, up towards Nanaimo. And we still have those snowfall warnings for the mountain passes as we head uh, through into the Kootenays. And on top of that, those outflow winds uh, bringing 110 kilometer per hour gusts to places like Prince Rupert and Terrace overnight into tomorrow morning. And those, of course, are coming from the northeast as those winds race towards the coast. Uh, taking you through that uh, precip forecast, it is clearing. So we're going from snowy and cold to clear and cold. Here's 7 a.m. Most of that precip will have ended. It's going to be a lovely afternoon, just cold. And if you thought the past couple of days were chilly, we are still to get into some of our coldest temperatures across the province. Minus 20s for places like Prince George over the next couple of days. And here in Metro Vancouver, Dan, mm -hmm. those uh, minus two temperatures will feel more like a minus seven Oof. in the morning with wind chill. So now we're into the winter phase of our three-day, four-season event. Whew. In the fall. In the fall. In the fall. Hard to keep track. <laughs> Thanks, fall. Joe. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome.
And that is your late news for Monday. Thank you for joining us tonight. For news anytime, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Have a good night. Thank you.